Stop chewing my pencil. I'm sorry, you have to move, baby doll. We're on film. Sophie, this is a video to try to shake out um, that three collision example we did at the end of lesson yesterday. Um, I'm sorry it was such a bear. Um, there's two real reasons why it was a bear. Um, one, because the book d decided to be mix and match with whether variables are inherently negative or whether we need to subtract them because they're inherently positive. And the other place that it was a bear was dealing with all the simultaneous equations at the end, which in retrospect, I feel was unnecessary. <laughs> so I'm sorry I chose this example, but I think there's some important things we can uh, squeeze out of it. And so one of the things is setting up momentum equations. One of the things is setting up restitution equations. One of the things is being clear and consistent with your variables and negative numbers. And the last really big thing to get out of it is that however hairy a situation is at A level, it is sort outable. It is understandable and it can be sorted out. And whether you find the end result satisfying is a personal opinion, but you should be able to get there. Um, a level is a level is a very carefully curated swimming pool. There's a deep end, but it's a swimming pool. You're not in the ocean. And it's really important, I think, to keep that in mind because it can really feel that you know you're just thrown out in the wild waves of the material. and that's that's never the case. Even when it looks ugly, that's never the case. There's going to be certain principles that they want you to to pick up. Um, that's true in pure math, it's true in stats, it's true in mechanics. So I really hope I can illustrate the, you're supposed to use these three principles and then it's just a matter of plucking out the numbers from the story. I hope I can convey uh, that perception to you as we talk about math. All right, shut up, Elizabeth, let's do the example. Okay, so um, you already have a scan of these notes, but I just wanted to talk it through. Um, yes, I am recording, thank God. Okay, so. Um, there's three collisions. So, so here's the story. In the beginning, you've got two equal point masses, you know, um, spheres. Okay. Two, two, two masses, A and B, um, A is stationary and B, uh, excuse me, B is stationary and A is moving toward it. They, uh, A smacks into B and now they both have velocities. Then B smacks into a wall and A and B have velocities. And then B smacks into A and they have velocities. So that's the layout of the story. And here's how you start piecing it together. Oh, so the idea was every time something smacks into something else, the coefficient of restitution is the same value. And with certain initial velocities show that E is one, okay. Yippity skip. It's 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 contrived in the hopes of getting you to practice the concepts, um, which is a thing that happens with examples. Okay, so one of the challenges in this was notation. And at the very end of the example, the book goes on to say, Oh, by the way, we chose U and V and subscripted <laughs> to sort ourselves out. And um, I talked about this problem with my friend Colin, Colin Beveridge, you may or may not uh, know the name. Um, and he said, well, he agreed with, with us that U has connotations of initial velocity and V has connotations of final velocity. And it's really not helpful to change that um, connotation. So I like what we did with A's and B's. Let little A be the velocity of sphere A and let little B be the velocity of sphere B. And there's going to be four sets of velocities. What happened before any collisions occurred? After one collision, after the second collision, after the third collision. And then we can subscript accordingly. And I think that makes sense. Um, so that's, that's what I did. <laughs> okay, so everything that you and I talked through was mostly right, but I... 
I got tripped up with the book. So I just want to talk through everything so you feel sturdy. Okay, because one, one of the really horrible feelings that can happen with physics, probably other subjects as well, but with, with physics and mechanics is that you think you understand it, then you look at it again and it all falls apart because you didn't have the grip that you thought you had on it. So I want to make sure you have a grip on this. All right. So in the beginning, B is stationary. So B's velocity is zero. A is moving toward B with velocity U. And I'll take to the right as positive and to the left as negative. And it's always useful to do a little sanity picture. Okay, so A smacks into B, and this is the picture afterwards. I know that B moves off to the right. I'm not really sure which way A moves. I have some ideas based on, you know, experience with smacking billboard billboard balls, billiard balls around. Um, billboard balls, my God. Um, but it doesn't really matter in our story. Um, I, I know that B has a velocity, A has a velocity, and I can write equations with those numbers. And what I'm doing here, and this is one of the big deals, um, is I'm going to let, you, sh you should pause the video and take notes on this. Um, I'm going to let my variables be inherently signed. That is, if A is a negative number, it's just going to be A. I'm not going to write minus A to show direction to the left. I'm just going to call it A. And if it turns out to be negative, then I know it's going to the left. If it turns out to be positive, I know it's going to the right. And that is the, the sanest way to deal with your variables. And Sophie, this is where books muck around with it and teachers muck around with it. And it's why students think everything is impossible and hard. This is one of those places. So if you are able to realize that, then it's going to help you come to sanity with a lot of this stuff and realize that it's not you. It's somebody messed around in this flavor. That's why it's being weird and difficult. And you will be able to sort it out um, to your own satisfaction is, is, is my hope. Okay. So velocity is after collision. A sub one, B sub one. Okay. Um, so we can write two equations. The momentum equation, um, they're equal spheres of some unspecified mass. So we'll just say M. Um, and beautifully, the M's divide themselves out. Okay, but here's your, your momentum equation that you should always write in full every time. Mass times velocity plus mass times velocity. Notice that that's a plus. I, I don't care about direction. The variable will contain its direction. Yeah, if, if that doesn't make sense to you, please, please uh, bring it up with me. But I, th I think you get that. Okay, mass times velocity plus mass times velocity equals mass times velocity plus mass times velocity before or after. Okay, and that simplifies um, m's divide out. We said that u was a's initial velocity, b was stationary, and there we are. And that gives us one equation. And I think that was okay. Um, we can do the restitution equation. To save myself the fraction, I brought the denominator up against the E. Um, if that's unclear, pause the video and scribble it out for yourself. But I think I think that's reasonable. That's the difference in initial velocities. That's the difference in final velocities. I'm keeping order the same because that's how we stay sane and slap a negative because I want E to be a positive value. Okay, so I think that's okay to set up. <clears throat> Excuse me, I can drop in the values for the initial velocities and I come up with this equation. Okay, grand, and we match the book at this point. Okay, in the second collision, okay, so B was stationary, A smacked into it. A is still moving. I don't know which way, I don't really care. Um, B smacks into the wall and comes back to the left. Okay, so these are the velocities after the second collision, A2 and B2. Well, A2 is the same as A1 because nothing happened in this part of the story to A. And I don't know what B2 is. I know it's a negative number, but I'm just going to let it absorb its negative. Okay, so we can't write a momentum equation. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, but we can write a restitution. You know, I, 
I'm going to do that. Um, I'll do that as a separate video because I think that would, would help um, more than just you to have that conversation. Um, okay, so the restitution equation, you know, same thing, you know, difference in the final velocities, difference in the initial velocities, smack a negative on the E, keep your order the same. Okay, so this has to do with the ball smacking into the wall. And, you know, this is this is a nice way to, okay, I, I know, uh, pause the video and take notes, Sophie. I know that sometimes they write restitution. If you just have one object, they'll, they'll do this. If you just have like a ball smacking into the wall, they, they, they teach this. And that's okay, but it you can use, you know, the, the whole darn, and there ought to be a minus in there. <laughs> you can use the whole darn thing um, with something that's stationary. It just means that, you know, two of those velocities are zero. And then you come to the same. So that's, that's nice to know. Okay, so... Um, the wall's velocities, ball B's velocities, there's our equation, happy days. We differ from the book. This is where we differ from the book. I think what the book did was respected negatives for momentum, but when they wrote restitution, they just kind of got loose and fast with it. And that just honks me off for 16 thousand and one reasons don't don't do that keep your equations keep the negatives don't don't muck stuff around pete's sake i think we're in agreement if if you feel sticky on that drop me a note but this is the correct way to set it up this is what will make sense to you and the book should have done it the book came out correct because they were consistent in their inconsistencies <laughs> But that's like saying, well, I just magically saw what to do and it works because it worked and that's not helpful. So do it like this. All right, rant over. Okay, so far so good. So you've got your, your. Uh, uh, we'll come back to why you don't do momentum when you slam into a wall. And there's, a, <clears throat> excuse me, there's your restitution equation. All right, so the third collision. So B is smacked into the wall and B is now traveling to the left and manages to collide with A. And this is what happens after that collision. B comes to a rest, according to the story, and then A does whatever it does. Um, I think through practical experience with billiard balls, um, I think A takes off to the right. Excuse me, what direction is that? A takes off to the left. Um, but we don't really care in the story because we're not asked to solve for any of the velocities along the way. So I'll just call it A3 and it can be positive or negative or, do, or zero, whatever it likes. <laughs> There's the variable for velocity after the third collision for A and for B, and I know that his velocity is zero. It would be pretty challenging if A ended up moving to the right because B is in the way. But you know, quantum stuff happens. Who 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 am I to say? So here's your momentum equation. Adding, adding, letting your variables take on their own negativity if they need to. The m's divide out, drop in your velocity, and we've got this third momentum equation that matches the book. Okay, and your restitution equation, final velocities, initial velocities plop in your values, and this differs from the book. The book has a plus there, and that honks me off. And I think the reason they, I don't know the reason they, they did it. I don't know the reason they did that. I think they took B's velocity, variable is being positive and stuck a minus in to account for it going left or, or just stripped it out entirely and so i don't sophie i don't know <laughs> it was a horrible way to behave and i don't agree with it do this okay so if you need to pause and uh figure out for yourself how you come to this point please pause and do that if you're unsatisfied with where this equation comes from drop me a note okay but this is this should, should, that's a terrible word. 
my hope is that this equation will will help your brain to relax and go, oh, okay, that's that's what I've been wanting to write. Okay, so this differs from the book, but this is correct because negatives. Okay, I don't know why I'm pausing because you can pause the video if you need time to think. I hope that's okay so far. <clears throat> so what we've got is five equations. You know, we, we would have had six, but we can't do momentum with the wall. So we've got five equations. And the goal is to show that E equals one. Now, if I'm absolutely honest with you, Sophie, which I, I hope I always am, um, this is a big, tedious exercise in elimination. Um, here's your five equations again. I labeled them so I could show you which ones I'm combining as I go. I use Greek letters because I could. Um, and I can talk you through what I did. I did a slightly different approach than what the book did. Um, I don't know a clear way to tell you how I knew what to do. Um, and that's very unsatisfying. Um, I think it's a result of having years and years and years of experience of mucking around with algebra and simultaneous equations. That's part of it. Um, part of it is I know that I need to get rid of A's and B's and U's. So I just end up with E equals one. So you, you so you, your motivation is to look for ways to start simplifying this mess. This would never happen on an exam because every student would get lost at this point. And you just don't have time to waste like that. But if you're curious to see how it shakes out, I'll keep talking. So <clears throat> um, this is how Colin saw it. And it, because I made him sit down and do the problem with me. Um, I, I think it's a nice way to, to approach it. Um, the book did it slightly differently, which just goes to show that sometimes there's multiple roads to Rome. <clears throat> okay, so that's not how the saying goes. There's sometimes there's multiple roads to Rome. Boy, what what a what a weasel rephrase of all roads lead to Rome, eh? Okay, so um the first thing I did was got rid of A3. And because, uh, and maybe the motivation is that it, it appears cleanly in exactly two of the equations. So you can just set the right-hand sides equal to each other and bang, we're done with A3. Okay. And then the next uh, thing that Colin did was he got rid of U. That sounds really personal. Let's get rid of U. Um, and I guess his motivation was that this is already solved for U. So you can just sub, sub it in right here. And that's, those are the only places where U occurs. So bang, get rid of U. Okay, so we've used those two and we've used those two. We haven't used that one yet. Okay, so then Colin said, all right, let's use that fifth original equation to get rid of B2. Again, it's solved cleanly for B2. So every time there's a B2, I can just shove it in the equation and it only affects this one. So I substitute and I come up with this. And now these are my two working equations. Okay, so I've got A1s and B1s running around and, and E. Um, and the hope is that the A1s and B1s will take care of each other and I'm, I'll just be left with E. Now this is where Colin, Colin is very, very good at explaining things, is very good at, <clears throat> at spotting patterns and finding a clear way to explain what's going on and why he did what he did. And he looked at this and he's like, I think you had, I think they expected you to be clever. <laughs> and that that's an indictment of the question and not of the student. Here's what we did. Okay, so these two equations, <clears throat> um, I wrote them out again, so they'd be clean to see. Those are Greek letters. We can talk about the Greek alphabet sometime if you like. Um, and he 
<clears throat> Sorry, I'm really hoarse today. <clears throat> he multiplied out the brackets. Okay, that's each equation multiplied out. And then he took the first one, or we, I, I did it too. Um, take the first one and he put the A's on one side and the B's on the other and factorized out. And I don't really know what his motivation was working from here forward. I mean, for me, Sophie, it would be, okay, I've got these two equations. Now I'm just going to sandbox with it. So I have my sheets of scrap paper. And I just start fiddling around. If I hit a dead end, I go back to the beginning and start again. And that is unsatisfying. I don't really know what to tell you. I think Colin was a little bit faster on the uptake because he saw the A ones and the B ones and thought, okay, well, maybe we can scoot things, you know, to different sides and do some factorizing business. Maybe that will be useful. So I can do that for each of the two equations. This is your second equation. You know, sh uh, shove the A's over here, the B's over there and factorize out. And then maybe we can see what we're looking at. And this is the, the 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 seeing it step, which I don't think is very nice to tell students they're expected to do. But to show you how we did it, okay. Colin said, maybe this is what I did. He might have done something slightly different. This is what happened. Um. Both these left-hand sides are the same. That left-hand side is the same thing as that left-hand side, which means these two right-hand sides are equivalent. So here's that right-hand side, and here's the other right-hand side. And I guess to go back and be a little bit more fair about <laughs> my irritated comments, a little bit of poking around with the algebra takes you to a point where you have something really nice, i.e. those two sides are the same, so you can just eliminate the A's and say something in terms of B. Actually, at this point, Colin dropped the superscripts, excuse me, the subscripts, and I suppose you could have done that at this point. Um, but when problems are crafted to come out with a clean answer, you know, show that X equals 17, then you're going to find something nice along the way because it's going to shake out to a nice result. Here's a nice result here. You know, um, you know, like like when you have um, hidden quadratics and hey, lo and behold, that thing factorizes. Well, yeah, they built it that way because they wanted you to play with exponents or they wanted you to play with trigonometry and they don't care about the quadratic equation. So they build you one that factorizes. So you get something nice it's reasonable to, if not expect, then to strongly hope that that's going to be the case. So, you know, the, seeing questions like this, Sophie, and hearing people talk about it helps you build your own experience and background. And the accumulation of that is what you will rely on as you go on to do math. You know, this is how you build experience. Has this put hair on your chest? Great. Okay. So where do you, you were, you're miles ahead at this point, weren't you? <laughs> okay. So here's the two sides set equal to each other. And then it's fiddle the algebra. And so I multiply out my brackets. I'm like, oh, yuck, an E squared. That's gross. Okay. Well, I'll scoot everything to, oh, perfect square. We factorize, bang. Another one of those nice things that happens because we're aiming for a nice result. So they've, you know, I mean, it, it, it wouldn't shake out nicely if these other nice things hadn't happened along the way. And there we are. And that's the question. I'm going to stop the video here because I think I've babbled enough. Um, please give me a yell if this was unclear. All right. Thanks for watching.